Hello, I'm Evan Hackle. I am the founder and CEO of Engage Consulting. What I do is I help organizations, primarily uh, franchise organizations, co-ops, and manufacturers, distributors with elite dealer networks, engage their customer base and engage their employees for greater growth and improvement of their company. Today, we're gonna to talk about leadership and we're gonna talk about engagement at a higher level, a level which involves involvement, where you involve people in the process, not just involve people in the process. I know that sounds interesting and intriguing, so you're gonna to have to listen to hear more. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, is the founder of FullMontyLeadership.com. He's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of leadership excellence. I'm your host, Del Barron, founder of Full Multi Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Del Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives, part of the Full Multi Interview Series, where today we're going to take an insider look at is there a difference between being actively engaged and being actively involved. If you're a new listener, new viewer to the show, thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. You can also now find us on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Tune.fm, Stitcher, and a whole bunch of wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, you can also tune in on your terrestrial radio stations every Monday and Thursday on a range of stations around the United States, including in Boulder, Colorado on 96.3. If you're a regular to you, if you're a regular listener, big thank you to you for making our show the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. And also, we're deeply grateful to Inc.com for making us the number one podcast to make you a better leader. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. And remember, we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get yourself over to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. You can do that on iTunes. You can do it on iHeart and on Spotify. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. As a leader, whether you're a CEO, someone in the C-suite, a sales leader, entrepreneur, or leader in any capacity, you know it's no secret that disengagement in the workforce is high. But here's the question. How can we effectively reverse it, increase innovation and profit along with engagement? Well, stay tuned because you're about to find out. Our guest on this episode is Evan Haskell. He is a thought leader, an author, and management consultant in the area of leadership, having started 10 plus businesses, including starting three different franchise businesses. Evan has managed five billion dollars worth of business. His book is Engaging Leadership. Engaging Leadership. We'll get to it in a minute, and it's in his second edition. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Evan Hacker. Great to be here. <laughs> okay, so at the opening, I asked um, about can we have active? Can we? Is there a difference between actively engaged, being actively involved? And the title of your book is the Engaged Leader. So not engaged, but engaged. I N G A G E D leader. So what is an engaged leader? Evan, tell us. Well, the word engage with an I, it stands for a higher level, and that's a level of involvement. Mm -hmm. So in business, you can engage people by, you know, I'm the CEO of the company, I come out, here's our vision, here's where we're going, here are our customers, and you know, this is what we need you to do, and you're engaged. Right. But you're not engaged from a point of involvement, you don't have a sense of ownership. So I'm taking that word engaging, and I'm using the word I instead of E, indicate a higher level. And this is where you talk to people and listen to people and you involve them. So it's not, you're just engaging them by sharing. And the great example of this is I'm like 
a major Red Sox fan and Patriots fan. I know I got a lot of hate going on right now, but, <laughs> but, and I'm engaged. I'm watching games. I'm listening to sports radio. I'm listening to sports podcasts, etc. But they never asked my opinion. Right. Bill Belichick has never called me up and said, Evan, I'm thinking about trading someone. What do you think? Right. Now, as a fan, that's fine. And in companies, that's the way we tend to engage people is we tell them what's going on, mm -hmm. tell them what we need them to do, but we don't really involve them. Right. And if you involve your employees and if you involve your customers, which is a big part also of what I advocate, mm -hmm. you change the dynamic, you, you get you win people's hearts and soul because they bought into the process because they were part of developing the solution. Yeah, that's a very good point. So for the leader looking in right now, watching us, listening to us, they go, okay, you know, I've been trying to do better at being more transparent and letting people in a little more and being finding ways to have them engage with us. Um, but they go, well, I don't really want to listen to <laughs> these people because after all, I'm the boss, I'm the CEO, I'm the CFO, I'm the CMO, CIO, whatever it might be. Oh, um, I'm I employed to be the, the all knower and I employed to be the person who knows what to do. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I hear this all the time. I'm sure, you know, if, you know, they they believe in me. And if I ask for their input, if I ask for their suggestions, if I ask for their ideas, then they're going to think I don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. And that leadership is about that confidence that the people look up to you and go, you know, you're the person, you know, um, what I find is the exact opposite. What I find is that when a leader shows vulnerability and shows openness to hear that it inspires people. And then ultimately, when you come to conclusion, when, in other words, it's not, this is not a process where like every day, hey, I'm making decisions. What, you know, what do you guys all think I should do today? You know, I just had breakfast. What should I do? It's about getting ideas for the overall business and the plan. Yes. And then when, when you present the plan, you're all executing to that plan, but they're going to feel the plans better because they were part of it. But this is the key thing. And if I was going to give people one piece of learning, it would be when you open up and you listen to your customers, when you open up and you listen to your employees, better ideas result. Of course. And that no matter how smart you are, you're not as smart as everyone. No. And if you can listen with the idea of why people are right and build from those ideas, you're going to build a faster growing, more profitable business. You're going to have higher retention, higher productivity, and it's going to make a major difference in your business. I like what you just said there. Listen with the filter that they're right. I think that even, you know, again, you know, particularly those of us who are a little older, we were trained to believe that the leader knows all the answers. And that, therefore, if we're in a leadership position, we should know all the answers. And that becomes a filter um, that stops us from seeing how people could be right. And I love what you're saying there about, well, look at it from how they might be right. Because, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a great Richard Branson story about him starting one of his first businesses and how he fired everybody and everybody hated him and thought he was an asshole because he got rid of everybody. But his whole point was, I don't want anybody who knows the, who knows the old way. I want to look at it from as a virgin. With virgin eyes, yeah. with virgin ears, and 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 I think there's two sides to that. There's the people who are on the front line dealing with the people who really know at a level a CEO or a C-suite individual is never going to know because people are not going to tell them or are afraid to tell them because they write the check. And at the other end is people who who have this wonderful, I'll call it how I I like this word healthy naivety, which is. I don't know, so let me look at this and let me look at it from a new angle. And really, it sounds like that's what you're advocating is that having them come forward because they don't have the limitations in their mind about that we might have about budgets or whatever it might be. Well, it's it really comes down to how you stage your thinking. So I used to be a person, and I, I this is about 15 years ago, I went to this leadership course and they did the whole thing on the conversation meter. 
And in my book, I make reference to it, although I, I think I, I've kind of got a different nuance on it. And so part of what they had me do is survey people and they asked me you know, to ask people, did I listen well? And I got, you know, fives out of five. Or, oh, you're a great listener, you're a great listener. And then it finally hit me, I'm not a great listener at all. I'm a great manipulator. So I would sit there and I would talk to somebody and I wasn't listening to why they were right. I was listening to why they were wrong, mm. defending myself. And I was asking questions. So at the end, I could say, Dove, you know, I just heard you. You just said this, 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 and this. And this is why you're wrong, because you didn't think of this. You didn't think about this. And you didn't think about this. So it is literally a change in your mindset so that you, you take away from yourself the need to be right to sit back and say, why could this person be right? Maybe mm -hmm. they're fully right. Maybe they're partly right. Maybe there's part of their idea and my idea that could that that could the match and to and to really work together. And your point, where you know the idea of virgin ideas and things, people in organizations, different specifically in large organizations, really see things from completely different points of view. Absolutely. And if, if you're in your own tunnel getting the same feedback back and forth and just reinforcing it, you're not hearing those things. So yeah. it's, 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 it's listening and it's actively listening and actively making methods for people to participate. So, you know, I, I love doing um, workshops. So, and, you know, I used to run a $5 billion company and we would, we would go around the country and do town hall meetings where we would bring in the franchisees or the members of the co-op and we, we would go around, we have 50, 60 people in the room and we'd present ideas and then we'd say, hey, how would you solve this? And, and we'd get great listening and we'd do the same thing with the staff and we'd have conventions and we, we'd literally break 1,400 people up into eight different rooms and facilitate listening and, and, and talking. And when you're open-minded, you get, you get tremendous things out of it. But in my small company where I've got about 20 employees, we pull everyone together once a year to do a planning meeting. Mm -hmm. And we talk about, you know, what's working, what's not working, what things can we do, how can, you know, what are the quick and fast things, what are the hard and long things. And we break people up into groups and ideas. And from that, we build a plan and then we share it with everybody. And I, when I go there, I'm CEO of the company. I do not facilitate the meeting. Right. Um, I sit back and I listen and I have someone else facilitate the meeting and, you know, when I I'm careful to, to always comment last for fear that whatever I say will be repeated. Well, you, and, only, not only will you repeat it, but you automatically set a tone. I mean, it's one of the things that uh, Simon Sinek talked about in his last book, which is that, you know, as a leader, you need to speak last so that you yeah. don't influence because everybody in the room was going, oh, you write the check. So you're right. So I'll shut up. Or I'll just agree, right. and what you end up with is not innovation, not fresh ideas, but sycophantic responses of people who are tugging their forelock and going, "Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir." Yeah, that, that that's that's exactly right. And you take time to compliment people that have thrown out ideas and say, mm -hmm. "You know, I've never thought of that." You know, that that that's brilliant, and and you do hear brilliant ideas. And yeah. it, it's, it's amazing. Just yesterday, I got called from one of my clients that I work with. They have a buying group. And he had zero committees. He didn't have an advisory council. He didn't have a product committee. He didn't have marketing. He had nothing when I met with him in October. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like a lot of times when I meet people, the person hi hired me actually to give a speech. And, and I started chatting with him later. And I said, you have no committees. And I said, you got to read my book. And he reads the book. And anyhow, he calls me up because he's now ready to hire me. And he says, you know, I started committees. And he says, I was so afraid of them because I was so afraid they were just going to make my life harder. Mm -hmm. And what he said is it made my life easier. But he said, these people become so passionate. And the, the, the confidence in the entire membership of the buying group has changed because they're hearing not just from me, but they're hearing from other members and, and that it's, it's a total change in culture. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it makes a huge difference because when you're involved with an I and you've been asked your opinion, you've been able to voice your opinion, your dedication, your passion is so much higher than when you just talk to. 
Well, it, it's interesting because I think that you know what you're talking about is is vitally important in a in an evolving uh, organization. But I, you know, for me, in many ways, leadership. What I see in one area translates over to another area. You know, when I look at, you know, the even politically, the hard left wing, the hard right wing, and everybody's living in their own bubble and they're surrounding themselves with people who are sycophantically agreeing with them. And that's not, it's not only not bipartisan, but it's not open thinking. And so we, we don't have that. And so even if there's a town hall, very often the town hall is set up so that, you know, you've got polarizing responses rather than somebody saying, here's a, here's a virgin idea. I don't agree with, I don't, I'm not, on your in your bubble, I'm not in your bubble, but here's something fresh. And I think that that is like that's a lesson. This involvement, as you're talking about it with an eye, is so important across the board, not just in companies, but in 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 communities, in cultures, in all of us. That we need to do this because we are we are living on a planet that is far smaller. We are culturally crashing everybody's boundaries. And at the same time, uh, tribally keeping our, <laughs> our what's right and limiting ourselves. So it's it's a fascinating dichotomy between this globalization and this tribalization. So and what you know, you, if, if that tribe is your organization and you're surrounding yourself with people who only think that you're the way you do, then there's no real innovation. And I, and I love that about what you're saying. It's like you've got yeah. to be more inclusive. No, you, you're totally right about bubbles. And, you know, we in society, you know, hang with people that share similar beliefs. We watch similar TV channels and get our news from similar places. Same thing happens in work. Yep. You know, people are part of a department. They feel loyalty to that department. And, you know, they feel like, you know, they're, they're, they're right. Others are wrong. Um, and cha- creating an environment where people feel very comfortable speaking, sharing, talking, Um, is incredibly important. It starts at the top. There's no doubt that it starts at the top. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, I I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've had people ask me, well, I've got a boss that doesn't listen to anybody. What do you suggest I do? And, you know, and and, and I I go, you know, that's that's a real, you know, know, give them my book anonymously. (laughs) But, uh, you know. Well, find another job. (laughs) What I tell everybody is, there's a concept called mirroring, which mm-hmm. is people mirror other people and that you set in your role the goal of being engaging and listening to people. And you can get feedback um, from your team, your staff, your customers. You can also get feedback from peers. You can also get feedback from, from people that you report to. And if you become good at being an engaging leader, then other people will become engaging leaders and the organization will change because of what you have done. Mm-hmm. And that it's not, the, the goal isn't to sit back and say, how do I fix someone else? First, first off, that in itself is kind of a strange way to look at it. It's just how to be the best person you can be. And then what you'll see is people will respond to you differently. You gotta and model the behavior you want. Yeah. Right? You just gotta exactly. model it, you gotta do it. And, and it's hard because as you said, you know, a lot of the people you speak to, I speak to will say, yeah, but they just won't listen. And, uh, and even if I do that, I, I get it. Even if you do it, some of them won't. And it, and if it doesn't happen because often leaders are bullheaded and egoic and all the things that are wrong with leadership, often that's the case. But often it's not. Often the, there's a leader who says, okay, it's safe. And, you know, as somebody, and I know you do this too, it works with the upper echelon of leadership. You know, it's the thing I'm challenging them to do all the time. Leaders go first, go first, be vulnerable, be inviting, be involved, be engaging, listen. Um, but you're right. I mean, very often uh, an employee will say, my, my boss doesn't listen at all. Um, and you've got to just step forward and model the behavior. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things is that I think that being in that, you know, you brought it up before where you said uh, the person who didn't have any committees and thought the committees would make it harder, but it makes it easier. I think that, and I want to, I want to hear your point. I think that following my own bias is 
safe. And I think that if I follow my own bias, that in in this world that we live in now ends up being the ultimate risk. T tell us a little bit about what you think about that. Why you think well, maybe safe is yeah, the most I mean, risky path. Well, look, look at the, the biggest mistakes I've made in my career are when I, I have come to conclusion about something we as a company ought to do and haven't researched out to whether customers really want it, mm -hmm. whether our employees think customers really want it, whether our employees think that we should do it or not do it. You know, it's, it's amazing when you come up with a brilliant idea ultimately that fails, that when you go to the team that knows it will fail, how unwilling they really are to work on it, and then you get mad at them because they're not working on it, and then eventually you get it done, and then you put it out to the world and no one buys it, or not no one, but you know, it's a lot less than you think, and you've just wasted all this time, money, effort, and, and more importantly, opportunity. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's hard because you, if you're a smart person, and most people here listening are, because you're leaders, you're, I mean, you're not, you know, you know you're, 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 the people listening on this call are, are not dumb people, and they have great ideas. But, you know, I like to say, I have a lot of great ideas, and I also have a lot of really bad ones. And I sometimes can't tell the difference. <laughs> and it's having that humility to go out there and, and, and ask people and share and, and, and get feedback and, you know, and, and, and try to do it, you know, it's always better to do it at, at at the beginning. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I'm going to share a, an example of a failure, if that makes any sense. Please, and, yeah. Okay, so um, my training company, Toral Training, um, we work with tons of large restaurants, and each and every one of these large restaurants is doing food safety training. Mm -hmm. They have to, okay? Yes. So I came up with the idea that, you know, what if we came up with generic food safety training that they could label themselves so that they didn't all have to spend the same amount of money. And I, and I sat back and I said to them myself, you know, this is, this is brilliant. You know, everybody will want ours and, you know, we'll have a competitive advantage gets over our, all of our competitors because, um, you know, we can give them something, you know, that they can use an annual fee for a couple thousand dollars instead of spending $50,000 building it. Right. And, you know, they'll love us for it. Um, came out with it about four years ago and have not sold a single one. Wow. Now, now you can sit there and say, why in the world? Well, you know, every restaurant does things differently, mm -hmm. you know? So we teach people how to wash hands. It's really cool how we do it. But, you know, in, in our, in our um, restrooms, you know, it says turn on the hot water. Well, what if they don't have hot water? Why don't they don't have a knob? You know, and they have standard things and they want them – exactly like the environment mm -hmm. that they have. So, so my idea of generic, you know, I thought brilliant, wasn't brilliant. If I had, if I had done this right, I would have said to the group, I've been thinking about this, if we were gonna do it, how would we do it? Mm -hmm. And they might have thought of different ways to do it, ways that we could have brought in, okay, you know, let's build it, but let's, instead of doing video, let's do pictures and then they can insert their picture. You know, they, I don't know what the solution is. Right. And then, then, then we could have gone and talked to customers and said, look, if we did this, et cetera. And we could have come up with something much better or determined it wouldn't have worked and known mm -hmm. it wouldn't have worked up front. Right. Um, you know, so it's, you know, and I know that's a, like a really granular thing that probably doesn't directly apply to. Well, I think it does because I think that anybody, I mean, at a simplest possible level, uh, we're all biased towards our own genius or our own stupidity. Yeah. Right. We see ourselves in a moment, a flash of genius and go, oh, my goodness, this is brilliant. Everybody's going to want this. I've done it way too many times. Yep. And I've also had ideas that I thought Ugh, that's never going to go. And it actually was genius. And if I didn't yep. have people to fall back on, people, you know, who are who I can trust, who are bright and innovative and insightful and can look at it with a virgin eyes. If I don't have that, then I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead or throw it away, you know, sort of as an absolute. But what you're yeah. suggesting is this may be a great idea, but it may be a great idea with tweaks. It may be a terrible idea. 
Yeah. But we don't know until we find out from the feedback that comes from involving, again, the involvement of others. And I love what you're saying about that. It's important. Well, and, it, and it's key to get to get the creative ideas of everyone to build what the solution would be, right. as opposed to taking my ideas. I'll, I'll sh- share an example. A large um, ice cream chain around the country wanted to redo their design of their of their of their ice cream shops, and they came to me and they said, "Evan, I need you to help me get a lot of people to come to our national meeting because these." They don't have to change them. We have to get them to want to change them. Right. So we're going to build a, a mock-up there, and we want them to come to the meeting so we can sell them this new design. So you've got to get people there because we get generally about 20% of the people there. So I started talking to their franchisees. I started talking to their staff. I started talking to management. And I found out that people don't go because they can hear and learn everything that they would have learned by going because someone hold, 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 holds their hand, literally visits them and tells them what they missed. So they sit there, why do I have to spend the time? Why do I have to spend the money? And I said, well, what if we change the whole meeting? So instead of the meeting being you selling them stuff, which who wants to go to that? Right. <laughs> um, and Let make it spend money listening. on a flight and hotel so you can sell me stuff. Yeah, not so right. much. So what we did is we said, look at, go to the design company and bring three mock-ups of what the store or the shops could ice cream shops could look like and then bring uh, critique sheets for everyone that's attending and go to everyone and say look at we need to reinvent the ice cream experience for our brand and you guys know more than anybody so we're going to bring ideas to you and you're going to help us make these ideas better they got 85% of the franchisees to show up. They had to expand into two other hotels. They could have got more, but they literally ran out of hotel space wow. because they had such a vested interest in the contribution. And when they heard, we're bringing three mock-ups and we need your help, it changed. So you went from involving them, hey, let's show you what we've done, and now you can, you're involved by it, to involvement with an eye where they knew that they were going to do what they what was going to happen at the meeting. They had more people sign up to be prototypes than they thought they were going to sign up to buy the system in, in, in the first place. Mm. Um, and they got tremendous support and a total change in feeling by the franchisees because they were able to contribute. And the end design by management was admittedly better than what they would have done on their own not by a little, but by a lot, because right. they got feedback from people that were doing work every day in those shops and knew how these things really worked, rather than the work they got by a display company that you know works in a lot of restaurants sure. and the staff, but without the people doing the day-to-day real work. That, um, that I mean, that that's a great example because that is that's an example of showing very clearly the difference between let's engage you in what our idea is versus let's involve you in creating something together. And, you know, I I, I mean, I I think of a great sales example is, is this, is that if you go out and buy something, you will tell your friends to buy that same thing. Because part of that is social proof. Part of it is your own ego. You don't want to look like a fool because you bought something. So you get your friends to buy it too. But when you're involved in the creation of buying something, that goes up 20-fold, 100-fold, whatever it is. I mean, just, and that's what you, you know, so they're bought into something because they actually were invested emotionally, psychologically, creatively, you know, input-wise. And it's just, it's just such a great example of that. One of the things you talk, let me, go on. Let me take this example into the sales process. Okay, good. Okay, so I have I have a management company, management consulting company. That's what I primarily do, and I have this training company. So the training company, we, we brought in new people, new ideas, and it used to be we'd go to a company and say, hey, you know, we build custom training, and we have this technology to house and track your users called a learning management system. You know, do you need them? 
And they might go and say, well, yeah, we're working on some courses. You know, how much would it cost you to build us a course on how to teach, uh, you know, like, like we did a thing with Dairy Queen to make a blizzard. We did a simulation. How much would that cost? Okay. And our and a sales team said, we have to stop doing this. And I go, well, this is what we do. We sell these things. How else would you do it? And this guy says, well, I'm a training professional. and We do a thing called the Dakin, which is a design curriculum workshop. And he said, so instead of going into somebody and saying, what do you need? We go to them and we say, you know, what are your problems? And let us help you solve your problems. And we stopped selling customized training and learning development. And we started selling design curriculum workshops. And we would go to somebody and we would say to them, look, it, we want to bring people from the real world, the people that are utilizing the training, the people that would be trained. Mm -hmm. We want to bring people in from your management team, your training team. And we will facilitate a needs analysis of what you need. And some of the things you can do, uh, you know, with simply with sales aid, some things you can do with online training, some things should be done with live training. Um, some things can be done with, you know, educational videos and, and go through and look at the whole process of what you're trying to achieve. Look for where the primary needs are. Mm. So what, what we then ended up doing is instead of going and trying to sell somebody a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of training, we go in and we're selling somebody, you know, a ten, fifteen thousand dollar in essence consulting project. Yeah. We're bringing their whole team in and we're ending up helping the client have a better vision of what they need and having total buy in support by the people that are going to make this decision in terms of who they're going to hire, mm -hmm. because when we're done, they don't have to hire us. They can hire anybody. Sure. We're giving the, we're giving them the, the plan, mm -hmm. but we've created the relationship and we've we've got the buy-in. You know, we're we're all thinking together, and then the end product becomes so much smoother and easier. And you don't make the mistakes of of you know you start something, you think it's right, then you got to go redo it, which is very costly because you really thought through things well in the first place. So totally change how we sell. The interesting um, thing about it, though, you know, a lot of what you're talking about, Evan, uh, to me, is the willingness to be nimble, the willingness to be flexible, the willingness to get away from rigidity. <clears throat> and I think that oftentimes in an organization, there is that rigidity. And, and I've spoken about this myself from the platform, that uh, rigidity goes by many names. So it goes by, um, this is our standards. It goes by names like, this is our tradition. And it even goes by the name values. This is our values. But what it really is, is rigidity. And I know that values, the work around values is, is a very important piece of, of what it is that you believe. Um, talk to us about using values, not as rigidity, but as something to uh, increase loyalty and commitment to a company. We we have a monthly meeting with the entire company, and a different person is responsible for talking about the company vision mm -hmm. in their own words and talk about company values in their own words, and that they generally speaking highlight the values of the company and examples of it in use within the company. And they compliment people for living those values. And um, what's interesting is our management meeting, we do two management meetings a month. And we start off the management meeting where everybody takes an example of a value and an example how we live that value. So the management company is doing it twice a month. The company is doing it once a month. If you're a manager, in essence, you're doing it three times a month. At the last meeting we presented um, in January, where we presented the, the year plan, um, and it was based on all the work that we had done in October and the budgeting and all those things. We said, let's for fun, just pretend that the year's over. Mm. And let's talk about examples of how we lived our values in this year as if the year had happened. Wow. And then everyone went around and envisioned how that would be. And it's, it's really, it's really, it's really, you know, cool. And, you know, one of our, our things is in the company is, um, our, our purpose is to make effective training easy. This is our training company. And so our joke is we don't make crappy training cheap. And one of, one of the things that we highlight is when we will walk away from business 
Right. When someone says to us, you know, look at, you know, we're looking to produce this. And it's going to be a PowerPoint. It's going to have a reader and it's going to be boring. And we know it's, it's something we don't want to put our name on. Um, and, you know, we reward people. You know, our ultimate goal is not to say no. Our ultimate goal is to enlighten and encourage and, you know, which is why we like to do the decums. But ultimately, to say no rather than to say yes when something isn't really living to who we are, because we're, we're, we're in that company, we're, we're, we're training champions. We're changing the world of training. I wrote um, a piece uh, for LinkedIn about a year ago, and it was called The Integrity of No. And it's, I think it's one of the most difficult things for any of us who have our own business or are self-employed in any way, is the integrity of no is a difficult thing to have. Because yeah. if you're in business for yourself, you know, I mean, at, at a reasonable level, you're thinking about the paycheck. You're thinking about making the sale. And and knowing that you have to say no to the wrong people, the ones who are not in alignment with the value of who you are, it, it can be extremely challenging um, and, and even very scary for a lot of people. Uh, uh, entrepreneurial types, but you may pay the rent, but you won't sleep well. <laughs> well I'll, give you, I'll, give, I'll give you, I'll give you another example. And there, there is no company value that matches what we did, but um, we had a client that we took on it was a very large client, a very, I'm not going to mention the name and you'll see why in a second, but it was a great name to have, you know, that they're, you know, it's nice to always have those names where you can go, oh, you do work with so-and-so. Sure. But their, their staff people were verbally abusive to wow. our team, you know, and so uh, renewal time came, we didn't renew. Um, and, you know, there, we don't, you know, we have values, you know, I, I don't know how you would call this value, but, you know, because we don't have a value saying we care about people in our company. Because I guess we just assume that is, is, is a value. It's kind but, of base. You know, you know when, when the staff knows that you're not going to accept someone verbally abusing you, um, you know, they appreciate that. And I have more than one time made phone calls to customers to say, you know, I've got great hardworking people and we need to change the dialogue and the tone. Um, and, I, and I've had really good conversations that have literally made changes. The example I just gave was one where we could not make a change. Right. Um, but you know, you've got to stand up, you have to stand up for people, the people in your organization. And when they know leadership cares and leadership's going to stand up for them, uh, it, it, it makes, it makes a difference. T uh, tell us and, about, tell us, a, because I'm, uh, the reason is I'm asking this is because I'm certain it, it relates directly to what you're talking about. You took over a bankrupt franchise business and transformed it. Yes. I'm guessing it's using the exact same principles you're talking about here. Give, walk us through a little bit of that. So the company that I worked with um, had a division in a company called Carpet One. And Carpet One was the largest um, brand in floor covering in terms of retail stores. Our number two competitor was called Flooring America. Mm -hmm. And their management team decided that they knew best and they started opening up all kinds. They opened up 400 floor covering stores and the, their floor covering stores failed. And that took with it their franchise system. And there were about, uh, they were uh, about 350 franchise locations, 202 franchisees. And when you have a company that's losing money and failing, um, they stop supporting the franchisees. Um, they stop doing what you know. Franchisees are paying them money, and they're not getting they're not getting their value. They sit back and you sit here and say, "We're paying these people money for expertise, and they can't even run their own stores." Right. Okay. Um, now this is go back. This goes back to 2000, so it's so a long time ago. When we went and we acquired the company, you know, it's sort of like McDonald's buying Burger King, and right. The franchisees sat back and said, you guys are just buying us to put us out of business. You don't care about us. Mm -hmm. And as part of the negotiation with the judge, everyone's agreement was sped up to a year. So in a year, every one of the franchisees could leave. They couldn't keep the name Flooring America, but they could stay in the flooring business. Right. And 
So we had one year to we had one year to save this business. So so one um, year for them to, to go from hating this company who's not been serving them to potentially wanting to stay with the company because they're free to walk away and they can compete. Yeah, exa so it, exactly. From their point of view, it would look like, okay, I can sit it out for a year because I, I can still hold my business. I can still, I can compete, but I'm just going to change the name. So I'll just say under yeah, a new name. That, 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 that's exactly right. And right. in fact, they didn't have to come to a single meeting. They didn't have to come and do anything right. at all. Um, and, you know, four years later, uh, we went from 700 million in system wide sales to 2 billion. Um, and we grew um, our same store sales by about 40 to 50 percent in four years, which was very, very remarkable. Um, and the way we did it was by listening. Um, first thing we did is run around the country and we did town hall meetings mm -hmm. and we invited everyone in and what do you like and don't like? And by the way, one of the funniest things about this whole thing is the ex CEO of the company and myself look like twins. <laughs> and <laughs> so <laughs> that was the, that was the topping on the cake. You know, you just, you look just like this guy. Yeah. So um, and by psychological process, you are the same guy. So yeah. if, if, if the other guy's a dick, then you must be a yeah. dick. And and therefore, I, if I, you're saying good things, you're probably lying because they've got that oh, framework in their head. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, totally. So I, I'll tell you, this is true. When I first started when we were having these first negotiations, I'm in the elevator with three, three of the franchisees. And I stick out my hand. I go, hi, I'm Evan Hackle. And they look at me shocked. And they go, why, why are you shocked? They're just saying hi. He says, well, the, the old CEO, who had a private jet, by the way, and a private cook that traveled with him, he wouldn't say hi to anybody. And I think, wow. really? Um, so we went around the country, and then we formed committees. We had an advisory committee, and then we had um, committees on product, marketing, training. We had salespeople committees. Um, and we got feedback and we started working on a plan and then we went back around the country a second time to get more feedback and share with them the ideas that we had. And one of the ideas that came out of this was I'd never done this before. And now I do it with every organization I'm, I'm with is create regional networking groups mm -hmm. where the franchisees meet regionally uh, by themselves. Um, and this networking creates great opportunities for them to learn from each other to encourage and inspire each other and for the system to get feedback. Yeah. Cause we can go to the people, the captains of these regional networking groups and say, Hey, can you ask this of your group and get feedback? Yeah. So we created these regional networking groups. And so we created a team of an, a, a team environment where everyone felt that they were part of the process and, and they were able to contribute. And we lost two out of the 202 franchisees. Wow. And those two never had shown up to a single thing. <laughs> That's fabulous. And, and the sad thing is, I was heartbroken to lose the two um, because I didn't want to lose anybody. Um, and so, you know, you develop relationships with people and you get to know people and and and, and things and, and and you listen. And, you know, what's interesting is after after this, I got promoted to running all of the of the re, of the retail uh, franchises and co-ops within my company, and the lar and the largest one, which was Carpet One, um, was doing very well. I mean, they were a fantastic organization, but they were growing at the industry rate, not two and three times the industry rate. Mm -hmm. And so, my task was how to energize them, how to you know to get them. And to be honest with you, it was easier with the upset disgruntled people than it was with the people that were pretty darn successful. Right. Because the people that, that when, when things were really bad, they were super paying attention. There was a lawsuit, they had a contract, there was, there was a lot of money involved, you know, and, and you they know, were there engaged. was a lot of passion <laughs> and, and there was a clear acknowledgement by everyone that what they were doing wasn't working. Right. Right. But when you go into an organization where, you know, the, the average location is doing seven or eight times the industry average already. And, you know, things are going pretty well to create that need. 
but we did exactly the same things. Wow. We, we, went, we went around, we did town hall meetings, we created regional networking groups, we created committees. We, they, they did have some committees before, but they weren't as engaged, they weren't as involved. And we created a plan with them and we energized them and we started increasing sales and beating the industry, industry performance. It just was harder. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not, interesting because as, as you tell me this, as you describe this, the way that you dealt with this, <clears throat> I'm reminded of a conversation that you and I had a few months ago where you shared with me a great lesson you learned from your father from somebody who owed him bit money in business. Um, would you yeah. mind giving us the sort of brief version of that? Because I think it really illustrates this point so well of you getting these franchisees back who were ready to burn the ships and run. Yeah, I, I love the story. One, I'm very proud of my father. I've learned so much from him. And, you know, he's, he's, he's since passed. But when I was about 12 years old, I attended a meeting of creditors, and there was this builder, and this builder owed my father about $15,000. Now, we're talking about 1972, so it's about $75,000, $80,000 now. It's a lot of money. Sure. And in, and in this meeting, people were asking questions, and people were literally hollering at this guy. And screaming, and these people were out a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. My father was in the meeting; he was very calm the whole time. Asked a few questions, and this poor guy's there. I mean, I felt bad for him because sure. people were literally screaming at him. And as I was going home with my father, I said, "You know, Dad, I don't understand. This guy owed you more than anybody else in that room, and you were probably the least unhappy person in the entire room." And and my father says to me, "You know, if being unhappy would have gotten me my money back." I would have been the most unhappy person in the world. As far as I can tell, it was bad enough I lost all this money. To become unhappy at the same time, what good would that do? And I love that attitude, but then the part of the story I know you really liked is my father went and hired this guy to become a salesperson for the company. So rather than having a grudge, rather than you know being mad and you know, I just want nothing to ever do with this guy, he sat back and looked at an opportunity and knew that this guy was well liked and well respected by lots of builders. He had lots of connections and that uh, my father taught him the kitchen business. We sold kitchen cabinets, um, taught him the kitchen business. And this guy became one of the most successful salespeople in the company. And that money that he lost, he made up by the opportunity he saw by not being mad. See, I think that, uh, that is such a great, <clears throat> great story, great example of this willing to involve, not just engage, but involve somebody, even when you feel like you're kind of in gypped, you know, and that still that, that willingness, that grace of your father and insight, you know, grace and yeah. insight. So that it took both. It's one thing to have insight. It's another thing to have grace. It's one thing to have grace. It's, it's another thing to have grace and insight together. And just that's a beautiful, beautiful lesson. We are getting close to the end of the show. And I want to I want to ask you, you know, you do a lot of interviews. You've been doing this a long time. Your book is, as I said, is in second print. So I know you've done lots of interviews. And obviously, our show is not as formulaic as many of them. But I want to ask you, what is the question that hosts don't ask you that you wish they would? What is the question that? The, you know, you're like, please just ask me that so I could tell you this piece. How do you start? People never ask me how to start. Hmm. And it's, you know, I think one of the really good things about my book is I actually give um, 21 pieces of advice that are like, do this. <laughs> you right. know, it's not, so it's not, you know, a lot of times you read these great books and, oh, yeah, I get it, I understand, but I don't really know how. Right. Um, so, you know, what I, what I what I would say to people is in your company to get to start and it has to do obviously with the size, right? If you have if you have 100,000 employees, um, you, you know, you can't hold a town hall meeting. No, um, but but, you know, I would start with meeting with your employees in a group and, and say, let's just take a second here and let's just talk about what do we do really well and what do we need to improve on? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would say, you know, if you're if you're a big company um, as a CEO, you want to do this with a couple groups and with your management team so they see it and then have your management 
have your management teams do it regionally. And I work with some clients with 70, 80,000 employees. And, right. and believe me, you can get engagement when you're that large. Um, and you can do tools and you can do surveys and, and, and augment. But most people listening don't, aren't running businesses that lot large, but also talk to your customers. People are afraid to go to their customers and say to their customers, hey, you know, why aren't we doing so well? They don't even want their customers to think about why aren't you doing so well? Um, but they know, their customers know, and their customers can tell them what they need to do to earn their business. And what I, I would say is, you know, invite, you know, depending, you know, if they're nearby, invite them to lunch. Uh, for me, um, we, we fly them in. We fly in an advisory council and we get a mix of customers and we bring them in for two half days and a dinner. And we sit there and we ask them what we're doing well, what we're doing well. We go through things and ideas and we ask them for their ideas. And then we prioritize, you know, from what you've heard, what's important, what's not important. Um, listening, to, listening, to, listening to your customers is, is an art. And so many people are afraid to do that. So when I talk about involvement, it's not just with the employees, it's, it's, it's with customers. Um, and it, it's, 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 it's really, really important. Um, and, uh, you know, even when like in retail where you're dealing with customers that are buying relatively small dollars, you know, you do focus groups, which are things that marketing people do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I like to just literally go into stores and talk to people. Um, and you know, part of what be I be the did undercover when I was, boss is that sort of the th idea. What be the undercover yeah. boss is that kind of the feel? No, no, I no, no, I'm I, I'm very I'm very candid. You know, I I'd come in and sit in some I I would go around and visit. You know, my wife always joked when I was you know running these bigger businesses is whatever town I was in I was I always go to the local stores on vacation. Mm -hmm. I go to you don't want me to make a special trip here, do you? You know, how can I be here? First off, I looked at everybody as as a friend and, you know, sure. so how I approach things. But I go, yeah, look, at my, you know, spend a half a day out of my vacation. You can spend it on the beach. You, I mean, you're not coming with me. Right. And, you know, and then then I would make trips, deliberate trips. But I would go and I'd sit in their stores and and I would, you know, when there were no customers in, I'd talk to the salespeople. I'd talk to the warehouse people and, you know, what things are right, what things are wrong, you know, and, and just little things. Saying, you know, it's like where you put your barcode on your on your on your label can be misplaced, you know, little things and then customers and go in and say, look, at, you know, I'm CEO of this company and I'm here and not here often, but you shop other stores. What do you like about shopping here? What don't you like about shopping mm -hmm. here? And and and, um, and and people like doing that. And uh, if not on vacation, but on work, you know, if I go into a city and there are 15 or 20 uh, locations, I would invite everybody and have a dinner with them. You know, not a town hall, just a dinner, just a social dinner. And just and, uh, you know, at some point, just say, hey, what you know, what advice can you give me? What recommendations can you give me? Um, but just start there. Just start, you know, getting together with people one on one, get together in small groups and and just simple question. What do we do really well in this company? What could we do better? Um, you know, it's 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 a great it's a great way. It's a great way, a great way to to have a conversation. Yeah, it's fascinating um, that it, oftentimes the most brilliant thing is the most simple thing. And, you know, the, the first rule is ask. Have a conversation, yeah. but ask. Be willing to listen. And that is often so simple, it's, it feels complex. It feels like, oh, my goodness, how would we do that? And the answer is you do it. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's fabulous. That's really awesome. Listen, it has been awesome having you here. Please tell our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, about your book, about the services and resources that you offer. So, because I know you've got all kinds of them, tell us where we can reach out and find out more about Evan Hackle. Well, the best place to start is my website, engage.net. So it's I N G A G E dot net. Um, in there, you'll see my book. And if you click on my book, there's a link to buy it. But there's also a free offer, which is I actually have a leadership guide to my book where I take a lot of the principles and, you know, a little secret. You could actually buy the leadership book and not, guide and not buy it. It's free. You could use the leadership guide without even buying the book if you can't afford the book. Uh, you'll get great things out of the leadership guide. 
obviously I'd like you to buy the book too. Sure. Um, but I'm also a professional speaker. Um, I do a lot of work on, on team building. Um, I do a lot of workshops where I help organizations get that listening, get that involvement and, and those type of things. And I'm, I'm a business consultant and I focus my consulting on franchising, on cooperatives and on, on dealer networks. So if you're a manufacturer distributor and you have an elite dealer network and how do you create a culture of engagement? And, that, and that's what I do. Uh, to be quite candid, when I go about a show like this, um, I'm not concerned with whether a single person goes to my website, although I would like you to, don't get me wrong. Sure. I just want, I just want to share what I know. I want to share that passion. And I'm not, I know 99% of the people here are never going to hire me as a consultant because you don't fit into that niche of who, who you are, but you're all leaders. And the principles I talk about work in business. Um, they also work in, in, uh, in religious organizations, political organizations, and, and any group, you know, where there are two or more people. Right. Um, and, you know, part, a part of our company is the concept of giving freely and openly. That's why my leadership guide is free. Um, you can read tons of articles on my website and I do these podcasts uh, because I, I believe that this concept is more important than I am. And I really want people out there to get the idea and see the impact of engagement with an eye on their businesses and in their lives. Well, I want to thank you for that, Evan. Uh, that is genuinely, truly generous of you. We appreciate that. And uh, I believe you. <laughs> so, you know, that that's really great. And I, I just want to repeat the, the website. So it's www.engage.net. That's I-N-G-A-G-E dot net. Is that correct? That's correct. And you can also, the book is Engaging Leadership with an I. And if you type that in Amazon, you can find it easy. It's in audio. It's in, it's in uh, what's it called? Kindle and, um, you know, Fabulous. Like, any, any which way. Thank you, sir. Well, I hope you'll stay with us to the end. We want to thank you. We're deeply grateful. And I want to thank you, dear listener, for tuning in, dear viewer. And please remember to share the show with everybody you know. Remember, the research consistently shows that one of the biggest challenges facing even the most successful companies can somewhat be counterintuitive in that these fast growing companies often hit a point where they realize that they're spending a fortune attracting, training and developing talent, but they're also having them leave them at an, uh, just an alarming rate. If you're sick of investing and training in you're developing your talent only to have them leave you before you've got your ROI, then come talk to us at fullmontyleadership.com where we provide you with the essential leadership skills to rekindle and amplify the hidden loyalty assets of your organization by tapping into purpose. FullMontyLeadership.com, providing you with the concrete soft skills to get you and your organization to the top and keep you there. Why? Because you can't outsource authenticity. And remember, get yourself over to Matrix.FullMontyLeadership. You don't need the triple W dot, just Matrix like the movie dot FullMontyLeadership. Dot com and get your authentic leadership matrix self-assessment tool. It's valued at $197. You get it free for being a viewer listener of our show. And it will allow you to really see the five areas of leadership, where your strengths are, where you need to work, and where you can bring yourself up and make yourself just an outstanding, extraordinary leader. Matrix.fullmontyleadership.com. I'm your host, Dov Barron founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deep greatness so that you can reach that next level, clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership. Stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can get more involvement, how you can just open up and listen a little bit better because the treasures that are there waiting for you are just one ear away. Till next time, Dr. Baron.